All right, so this week we're joined by one of the global superstars within the whiskey industry, uh, Glenn Fiddick's malt master, Mr. Brian Kinsman. Brian, welcome to the show. Great to have you, you here, my friend. Yeah, brilliant to be here. Or, or brilliant to be here virtually, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, vir- yeah, virtually. We were going to do this in person in Edinburgh, but unfortunately we're both kind of busy guys, I suppose. So that, that didn't work out. Yeah, yeah in a coordinate diaries. Uh, it was actually much easier in full lockdown. He always knew everybody was at home. Right. Suddenly people are out and about and getting the diaries linked together is pretty tough. I know, that's the crazy thing. And especially in Scotland, I don't know if you noticed this, but it seems to me like it's busier than ever when you go out, out and about at the moment. It's just absolutely crazy. Um, so, Brian, just to give everyone listening a bit of a sort of background as to who you are, um, you know, you are the malt master for Glenfiddich within William Grant and Sons. And I always consider you as one of the, the kind of new generations of malt masters. And I hope you don't mind me saying this, but looking at your background, you very much have this uh, degree that relates to making whiskey. Whereas I think when you look at the, the older sort of generation, they came up through the ranks. They started working at the distillery and moved into the role of, of malt master. And, you know, I think one of the the things that you do amazingly well is you're very much uh, front facing when it comes to the brands. You're happy to chat to people. You know, you're happy to do shows like this. And I've been to we've done several tastings together, which we're going to get into a little bit as we go through. But when did you realize that whiskey was going to be your career kind of moving forward? Was there a specific time where you're like, yeah, this is what I want to do? Um, yeah, day, day one at William Grant and Sons. Um, and, you know, that's, it's slightly flippant, but. I, I remember it so crystal clear. So I'd done my chemistry degree and then I did uh, about three years for a dental manufacturer in Dundee, which actually was a great job. Um, really interesting, making, designing dental materials. Um, and, and there was nothing wrong with it. It just wasn't, it just wasn't, you know, great. It wasn't, it wasn't stimulating it. And so I decided I either want to move into oil or I want to move into um whiskey because there was I wanted to stay in Scotland and they seemed like the two obvious places. Thank goodness I didn't go into oil when you see you know, how, how things moved over that right. 25 years. <laughs> but um but I remember I, I got a job in Gervin at the Great Distillery, day one going into the lab, um just bottles of whiskey everywhere, all the labels, all the all the brands, all the things I've never heard of and thinking, oh yeah, this is you know it just it was just very cool. I guess it's going to be a great place to work. And, and what year was that? That was January 1997. 97. Yeah. And then it was 2010 when you took over as malt master for Glenfiddich, right? Uh, the end of 2009. Yeah, 2009 yeah. into 2010. Yeah. I always remember that because I started in 2010. So I'm always like, yeah, around right about the same time. Uh, yeah, so, so let's, well, let's talk about how that progressed because one of the things that, um, you know, I, is, is amazing about you was you studied under David Stewart. Uh, so, you know, incredible gentleman who's been coming up 60 years within William Grant and Sons at Balvenie. He's been honoured by the Queen for his services to whiskey now. How was it under his tutelage with, with that throughout that whole period of your, your career? And, and how's your, your relationship still to this day with him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I couldn't really fault it. The whole thing was, was very easy and very natural. I got to know David not not immediately, but pretty early on because I was working in the the, the mature spirit side of the business uh, in terms of chemistry and analytical work. So a lot of projects David was was leading, there were his projects, and he was looking for an analysis to be done. So I got to know him sort of in the early days, um, and then when I when I moved into a sort of formal role as his assistant, uh, David's just got a very open style. You know, he, there was no secrets. We just we simply worked by talking and sharing stuff. And and if he went to the facility, generally speaking, I went to the facility. And and um, you know, he, he was he was phenomenally supportive of just making sure I knew what was going on. Um, and then as, as the time came up for David to what you might call semi-retire, but he he sort of reached sixty-five and stepped back a bit. Um, it was a completely natural process because so, we talked about it for so long and we had this date in mind and, and then it sort of happened and it's almost like nothing happened, you know, things just carried on and then here we are, you know, what's that, 13 years later, um, David's still here, uh, okay. still see him pretty reasonably regularly, not as regularly, I see him maybe, uh, maybe once every six to eight weeks or so now, hasn't really changed, you know, he's just, uh, he's, I think you said that he's a gentleman, you know, he's, very easy to talk to and work with. So humble. 
I think one of the most yeah. humble guys within the industry, you know. Yeah, especially for the for the impact he's had and yeah. the you know he's he's been out sort of selling the story of whiskey for for decades. Absolutely. I, and I think, you know, your job is is so crazy. We I touched on it earlier. You're very much front facing. You're doing a lot of these events. You know, we've hung out in New York under the, uh, the, the, the shadow of the Statue of Liberty drinking drams. We had a, a suite in the Shangri-La in Paris overlooking the Eiffel Tower, drinking some Glenfiddich 50 year olds. That was a nice romantic moment that we had together. Was nice. yeah. look, look back on that fondly. <laughs> um, you know, Singapore as well. We hung out there, just to name a few spots that we've had a dram. But what's the what's the craziest experience you've had so far within your career? There must be something that you're, you know, you're gonna say, bring your grandchildren over and be like, right, come on, let me tell you about what I did when I was uh, within my job within whiskey. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the, actually, the, the Statue of Liberty must be right up there. That was that was just a phenomenal event. You know, the, the, the actual event was amazing, you know, having the whole Liberty Island just for William Grant and Sons. Um, the, the fact that we then went on to sell a bottle of Glenfiddich for, for the, you know, the highest amount ever at auction for charity, as you know. Uh, that whole thing is one that you look at almost almost a little bit. I don't know if you feel the same. You go, did that really happen? Surreal. You know, you, uh, you, you sort of, you, so we're, I went on holiday to New York with the kids not that long ago, and you're looking at thinking, did we really... Up that island, and where we really standing there, as you see, at like midnight drinking, you know, thirty year old Glenfiddich or whatever it was. Um, so that, that's 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 well up there, definitely. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, um, just to explain to everyone what happened, there was uh, bottles of Janet Sheed Roberts, and they were auctioned off around the world. And one of them went in New York, and and yeah, we had a massive party uh, on Liberty Island, uh, and the auction for the for the bottle it went for. I think it was ninety four thousand dollars, right, Brian? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? stunning. Absolutely. All stunning. went to charity. Brilliant. Such good times. Um, okay, so Brian, the reason we're we're here today is we're chatting about these new releases of Glenfiddich, um, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But one of the things I also want to ask you about your job as the face and the master blender of not just Glenfiddich, but also some other brands within the William Grant & Sons portfolio, such as Grant, how do you manage your time? I mean, uh, you know, we've spoken to a few master blenders on this show before, and they're all incredibly busy, but they're only looking after one brand. You look after several. How do you manage that? Yeah, and sometimes it does get a bit crazy, and, it, and it's, it's hard to manage time. Um, I do it by actually doing a lot less of the public-facing stuff than it looks like. Um, I think that I think the team are very good at, at making it look like a amount and about more. Um, my number one priority is absolutely making whiskey. You know that that is fundamentally that's fundamentally what I want to do. It's the thing I enjoy the most. I, I like I like chatting about whiskey. I like talking to people, and especially if you get a, a group who well, there's two. You either get the real enthusiasts who want everything, and and, and that that's brilliant because you you, know, you you get a real in depth chat. But I love that whole explaining and almost introducing people to whiskey and saying, look, there's you're going to love this. You're just going to have to, you know, navigate your way through it. There'll be one that you, there'll be a whiskey you really, really like. So it, it's just about a balancing act and, um, you know, trying to make sure that the day job stays and and then almost the the, the, the public facing bit is, a, is a, an add-on and something that, you know, you try and make it work. Uh, it, does make, it does make for unusual things where literally you're, I, I might be finishing an event in Taiwan, back to the hotel room and have to log on to drams and, which is our stock system, and start literally making blends for the other side of the world because it's like we just need to get this done for production tomorrow. So it makes it it makes it challenging, but I, but I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy the that balance. Wow, that's I mean that's really interesting. You said that, so you can literally go online and start making blends from the notes that you have and and everything you have set up. Yeah, yeah, and um, and actually, it's a curse and and, and a blessing. The it used to be long haul flights. You, you simply switched everything off, had a glass of wine and watched a movie. Uh, the last time, which was a few years ago, admittedly, because I've not done so much travel, I think I was going to the US and I spent like five hours on the dram system, making up blends, looking at the stocks, uh, allocating casks, emailing back to the distillery to see which ones we wanted fatted together and filled off for cask finishes and so on. Because of course you've now got Wi-Fi pretty much everywhere. Uh, so as I say, Blessing and oh, it's, it's great. You can, you know, you can keep things going, but that little bit of downtime is yeah. 
know, it's just slow. It's gone. Keeping away. Yeah. yeah. So now, now you can't watch uh, Top Gun on the plane for the fifth time. No, exactly. Well, I think my record is Bohemian Rhapsody. I think I've watched that three times on a plane now. Really? Oh. <laughs> is that your go-to? Absolutely. I always get. I always stay away from like emotional films on planes. I don't know what it is. I, th- I tend to get a little bit more emotional when I fly. I've uh, I've caught myself crying at some things before. So I yeah, I always go for like the action ones. Yeah. 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 Good. Good tip, actually. You just <laughs> just put glasses on and pretend that you've got something in your eye. You're fine. Exactly. <laughs> I did have that once. That she, the 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 um, air stewardess came around and was like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "It's just an emotional movie." Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's get on to the big subject that we're going to talk about, which is the new Glenfiddich Time Reimagined series. And I'd say this is like the ultimate collection of aged Glenfiddich. It incorporates 30, 40 and 50 year old. I was lucky enough to sit down with you in London recently and go through all these. You know, Daz isn't here so we can talk about how amazing it was and how much of a good night that he missed out on. Um, But how does it feel when, you know, going back to what you've just described, I'm assuming for these releases, this is more of a physical thing when you're actually nosing these samples. And, you know, these are, are, are so rare. So let's chat about that. Let's chat about how you go through that process. You've obviously selected these, but how long have you been sitting and nurturing uh, these casks, you know, when we talk about this sort of age statement that we're getting to here? Yeah, I mean, the, as you might imagine, it's a very, very hands-on process when you're, when you're making... Uh, I mean, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to to go through the archive of old stocks and try to to create 30, 40, 50 year old whiskies. Because um, really, all the, obviously, all the all the hard work's been done generations ago. You know, making sure the the new make was right, the cask quality was good, putting it into cask. So I'm 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 sort of curating it at the end and being able to go in and, and pick the individual casks that we're going to actually bat and marry together. Um, the the the, the the key moment for me was 2007. So in 2007, I can't even remember exactly how we decided on what the stimulus was, but in 2007, Dave and I sampled every single cask of Glenfiddich and Balveni that was, I think it was over 30 years old at the time. Uh, so that meant going every, across the whole distillery, every, uh, all the warehouses. Uh, the samples to this day still sit in the sample room. It's a bit of a, a timeline of that's what it was like. And that definitely gave me a just a complete grounding in all the old stocks. So you think of everything from the, that had been at that time, the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, we probably just ducked into the early 80s. Uh, every single cask of Glenfiddich and Balvenie, we, we nosed them all, we tasted them all, we took notes. And so here I am, you know, what, 15 years later, st- I still use that, that, those original notes of, well, actually that cask back then was here and, you know, and, and almost seeing, seeing the journey. And you kind of just become, deeply entwined in the quality of those old casts because you you sort of know them by i can't say i know every number but you know certain numbers you think oh yeah i remember that one 1976 that's got a particular distillery character or whatever it might be and that that was the that was almost like the 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 best education you could ever get on pulling together vintages and ancient products that's amazing you do realize there's a load of people cursing you now going that sounds like a horrendous job that you had to do. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so I suppose, I mean, I was going to, what I, I think the interesting thing about that is when you get to something, you know, I, we're talking about 50-year-old Glenfiddich here with the, this new release that you're, you're, you're looking at. When you look at that kind of age, is it, you know, how is this aging? Is it still okay? Obviously, you have to keep a very close eye on the ABV with it not dropping below 40%. So how do you manage that when it, you're getting onto the, the super aged category? Um, so it is almost going back to what I just said there. It is that whole mapping it out in your mind, mapping it out on a spreadsheet, looking at the stock system, looking ahead to saying, it's trying to make that judgment call of when, when's that cast going to be either at its prime or... When, when is there a risk we're going to lose the quality it's got? You know, and, and it's a little bit of both. So, so there might be you might be thinking, actually, I think that could still take a bit more flavour, but I'm worried about the ABV, or um, it could do with a bit more flavour. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll marry it together with a sherry cask to try. And it is just that sort of jigsaw of, of trying to get the absolute maximum, both flavour and opportunity for every single cask. Mm. That's fascinating. I always remember you said to me something that's always stuck in my mind, but you know, you, you always said with Glenfiddich, everything gets put into cask with 
the the idea that it's going to go into 12 year old and you do you don't know right and we i have this conversation a lot with people about maturation but is there a certain age where you 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 feel there's something different going on in the cask that brings it you know you, you kind of earmark it then for these these older expressions um there's not a definitive age um and we we do random sampling as you know you know for, for a whole variety of reasons we're going to just draw stocks of all the different ages and, and at any point, I mean, we could maybe draw a five-year-old and just think, well, that's, that's, that's doing something a bit odd. And you simply block it in the, the stock system so that nobody can pick it, nobody can you know, take, take it for, for a product. Um, and it just sits there. And then you can, you can put little comments on. And, you know, and it might be that five years later, you try it again and go, actually, no, it's, it's fine. It's just, it's just it's come back into line. Or it might continue to become really unusual. Probably the, if I was going to pick an age, it would be, once it gets about 21 and over, well, A, the number of casts becomes more manageable to genuinely get to know them all. Um, and at that point, you're, you're starting to really put them into swim lanes of, yeah, well, that's, that's getting the real character for 21 year old, that one might stay for 30. Um, and then you get those little gems that you just stick away on the basis of, who knows, that just, it just feels really special and they might you know, keep that for a future vintage. A future vintage. That's amazing. So take us through these 30, well, the 30, 40 and, and, and 50 year old then. What's your, uh, let's start with the 30 year old. How would you describe that to someone? The, the 30 year old sits at the very top of what I would call the, the core Glenfiddich flavour profile, if you like. So that, you know, if, I, if I'm looking at new make spirit, I want to have that lovely green leafy, um, delicate hint of fruit uh, to spit it, and that's what we want to fill the cask every single day. Then, then the, the, the key milestones are 12, 18, and 30. So at 12 year olds, that real fruitiness should be right at the four, fresh pear, lovely the, the, the crisp apple. Move on to 18, six years later, it's, it should now be deeper, more intense, a little bit of baked apple, apple pie, you know, so becoming a bit more syrupy. And then at 30, it's, it's almost like at its peak. It's got that really lovely, dried fruits, Christmas cake, uh, you know, like the, 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 the reduced sauce from, from, from the apple pie, if you like. So it's, it's just become like very, very rich and intense. And I would always think of the whole range of that, you know, straight line through 12, 18, 30, 30 sets as a traditional vatting, no cast finishes, um, just a straightforward marriage of American and European oak and absolutely shines Glenfiddich. Beautiful dram. Um, and then when we get onto the 40 year old, I think this is something that, you know, it, when I talk about Glenfiddich and I still do a lot to this day, it's the whole family ownership and the fact that it's been in the same family all the way through. And this 40 year old is, is really cool for that because we talk about the, the, this remnant vatting that you do. So can you explain to everyone a little bit about how that works with the 40 year old? Yeah, absolutely. So the 40 year old flavor wise is, is, is much more influenced by European oak. So it tends to be a bigger, more intense, more sherry type dram. And the, the remnant batting process, it actually started out as a, as a really as a way of ensuring consistency and making sure that every time we bottle a 40 year old, we try to make it as consistent as possible. Albeit, you know, 40 years, that's, that's hard because obviously the, the individual character of the casks. But essentially all that happens is we, you do the very first batting, which I believe was 2001. And that becomes the, the blueprint. You know, we're really happy with it. It's got some, it's obviously all 40 year old, but it's got some super old Glenfiddich in it as well. And it's, it's got that really nice, deep, rich, and intense flavor. So we'll make a little bit more than we truly need. And then for batch two, we use you know, the remnant from batch one as the starting point and then add more casks. And going forward all these years, every single batch has been the same process. Fat a little bit more than you truly need for bottling, keep the remnant, and then build the following year's batch on top so that you're just always evolving, always, always almost having that heart. It's a Solera type process, but on a, on a super age going for it. Mm. That's incredible. I remember there was this, a stat that I first got when I talked about the 40 year old and there's the actual date for when some of that first liquid was distilled. Uh, I can't remember it now because I'm getting way too old, but I, I, correct me if I'm wrong here. I remember it was like some, some, sometime in July 1922 or something ridiculous like that. Would that be about right? Um, yeah. That... yeah, it was certainly in the, I can't remember off the top of my head either. It was certainly in the 20s. 
So there was yeah. some properly old Glenfiddich in there. Yeah. Um, clearly, you know, when we go out and talk about it, uh, because the rest, you know, the, the, the industry agreement, if you like, from the SWA and so on, is we it's simply forty year old and the minimum age is forty. But but we definitely layered in some older expressions just because they added that that real intense, almost leathery type note that you get from very very old whiskey, and and that that's you know that was in the very first fatting and by default has has been in every one ever since. Yeah, and then the big one to finish off with, which you know, I with the old. This is a new Glenfiddich 50 year old that you've just come out with, but you know I was very aware the the last 50 year old, we drunk quite a few a few uh, drams of it together, um, but I always talked about that being 50 years young as opposed to 50 years old because it was so fresh, and that's what I got down in London as well. It was almost like this, uh, it was like an orangey character to it, which you don't expect for something that's been in a cask for half a century, right? Yeah, I yeah, know, and. And that's certainly been a theme of the fifty-year-olds, and I know you know it's one I'd be keen to keep going because it's it's hard to find those casks, but it's almost a cask that has it's it's matured the whiskey, but it's not dominated it. It's 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 almost let the the, the whiskey just age as liquid. Um, so of course there's oak flavour, of course there's, there's you know there's a nice colour to it. It's got it's got the it's got the flavour of a of an aged Glenfiddich, but it's it's like a time capsule of the, the new make spirit character and then you know brought brought to life with exactly what you said there with blossom citrus uh, a little bit tropical you know mm. we, we talked before about the janet cheese roberts that was very similar it's a 55 year old and that, that really strong pineapple note the, mm. the 50 year old has has got the, the distillery character all sort of you know concentrated into a glass and then just oak Gently around the outside, so it's not it's not dominating. And it's a really nice juxtaposition between the forty with its big intense flavour and, and the fifty with its you know much more delicate, probably slightly challenging in terms of the almost the thought process, but such a such a beautiful whiskey to drink. And I'd be reminisced if I didn't ask you to talk about the packaging for the fifty year old because it's it's absolutely incredible. I mean, I saw it firsthand and. To actually see that in the flesh, it's it's it looks amazing in the pictures, I think, but in the flesh, it's it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I love it. It's 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 a bit it's out there. It's very different. Um, I love it for that reason. But it's a it's a three D representation of essentially the the weather pattern of Dufftown over the fifty years of the of the product. Um, and don't ask me the the maths algorithm is way beyond anything I can do. But basically, the designer took all that data and essentially found a way to plot it. And the part I found the, the most fascinating, and I don't know if you heard it the night we were in London, is he was talking us through it and he was actually able to, to put his finger down the passion and say, right, yeah, that's that's 1976. You know, that was a very, a very warm summer. And then, you know, to him, it's telling a story in, in 3D dimension of, of you know, what's happened in Dufftown over the last 50 years, which is... Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's mind blowing, you know, and, and and visually, it just looks amazing. Oh, it's stunning, and it's 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 aluminium that it's made of, right? Is that yeah, re that yeah, amazing? recycled aluminium. Yeah. yeah, I remember being in your lab, probably about I think it was about three, maybe four years ago. It was me, yourself, and uh, Beth Habers, and yeah. you let me try a Tabasco cask. Can we talk about yes. that or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see why not. Yeah. So how how's that getting on? Are you still got that aging, or is it been pulled now? Uh, we've still we've still got some yeah we've still got some so actually the 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 change in the technical file for Scotch whiskey was is an interesting one because mm. you know the it's a, it, it's much there's much more clarity about what you can do and I, and I like the fact that there's clarity and essentially to me there's a there's three tests there's a test of is the cask from a traditional source you know in other words does the does the person using the cask at the moment have they always used oak and is oak an integral part of their process. And so you, you know, you have to obviously go and, and find people who are using oak barrels in different ways. So in this case, it's a tech, yes, absolutely. It's it's a traditional source. Then it's are we using it in a traditional way? Are we are we simply you know bring it in and maturing whiskey in it and uh, cast finish or whatever it might be? And uh, absolutely tech, we're doing that. And then the third and arguably most crucial is does the whiskey maintain the, the traditional character of Scotch whiskey? And of course, in the, in the in the case of something as extreme as the Tabasco cask, it's a big cross. It's like absolutely. When I mean, you tasted it, your yeah. face goes beetroot red. It's like, <laughs> no, this is fun, but it's not Scotch whiskey. 
So, I, so I, yeah, I, I actually love it. I love that experiment. Um, I'd love to do something with it. Um, more and more people know about it because we've, you know, we've talked about it over the years. But uh, I mean, stay in the warehouse. I'm glad <laughs> stay in the warehouse. I'm not doing it. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> the SWA, though. So I know, like we chatted about this before. And I know you'd been experimenting way before that happened with regards to tequila casks and. I remember you saying like, oh, it doesn't really affect what I'm doing or any of the liquid that I'm playing about with. Is there anything that you have been experiment experimenting with since since that lot came into place that you've gone, oh wow, that this actually really works. I've never really thought about using it before. Yeah, I mean, arguably the experiment number five for the the, the orchard experiment, uh, pre-change to the technical file, it would probably have been a bit less clear about whether we could or couldn't use use those casks. Um, whereas actually, you know, we, we spent a long time working with the SW. Well, they're very uh, collaborative and helpful when it comes to you know, making sure we're all doing the right thing. And in that case, the, the, the first test was the one that I think is the most important one that says, yeah, the, the guys in Somerset have been maturing Somerset Pomona in oak for decades. It's a completely traditional thing to do. Um, so for us to experiment with that oak um, and and find that what it does is it actually accentuates and and complements the core character Glenfiddich and actually just just takes that apple note that's there anyway and just just sort of kind of brings it to life a little bit more but still clearly recognisable as, as Glenfiddich and single malt. Um, you know I think that I think that was a helpful change and it certainly it certainly made us more able to just to bring that to market. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting. And on that note, where do you see the industry being 30 years from now? Oh, yeah, who knows? I mean, honestly, because you think, if you say 30 years from now, you say, well, what, what about 30 years past? You know, 30 years past, it takes us to the, the sort of early 90s. Cast finishes were only just starting to really seep out across all the businesses, you know. Well, I've only been doing one since the, the sort of early mid-80s, but not really talking about it. It's just it's a part of the process for classic um, so if you think in 30 years what's happened you know the industry has transformed the, the, is the complexity the depth the breadth of flavor the different things we're doing i think the thing in the future will be much more distillery led stories rather than cast led stories i think you know changing mash bills um the long-term experiments you know things that things that we are doing today different at distillation or, or, or mashing or wherever it might be so it will be 21, 30, 40 year old in the future. So I think yeah. I think it's just the time scale we operate on. I think it'll be bigger, it'll be more interesting, it'll be more complex. And yeah. I think there'll be more long-term experiments. I mean, that's the kind of worms that would, you know, take this interview in, in, into another half hour. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going yeah, to not, move on from that point. I'm going to do, <laughs> I've got a quick fire question round for you here, right? So super quick questions to wrap this up for you. Maybe not all related to whiskey, because you know the way I like to roll. It's not always Absolutely. not always about whiskey. All right. So you ready for this? Yeah. Favorite drink that's not whiskey? Wine. Okay, you're told told that you no longer can be a malt master, but you can choose any other job in the world. What's it gonna be? Uh gardener. Gardener. Gardener, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Quite like to be outside. Sounds sounds like quite a nice job. <laughs> all right that's not that's not the answer that i was expecting from you <laughs> um what are you doing when you're not making whiskey uh well at the moment it's completely consumed by children you know my son's 17 daughter's 12 hobbies school yeah this family life is is uh very dominant and and brilliant by the way fantastic and you're still you're, you're not you're not playing the pipes as much anymore right yeah i don't play at all anymore um Maybe that'll be a retirement thing, but I suspect no, it's too much like hard work. And no, I don't I don't do any of that. I just I just watch them doing the things they do. Oh, and by the way, if anyone sees Brian in a pub and there's a pool table, do not take him <laughs> on at pool because he's a bit of a pool shark, by the way. Just a little warning there. Um all right, so any times you've experimented with any kind of whiskey and it hasn't worked? Uh, yeah, many times. Yeah, yeah. The early days of, of wine trials were, were challenging. You know, we had some we had some ones that it was never a wholehearted disaster, but it, it certainly they certainly you can't assume they're all going to work. For, that's for sure. Favorite person in the whiskey business, excluding David Stewart, because you're not allowed to say him, because that's obviously going to be your your. I, I think that might be your choice. Yeah, that would have been an easy one, wouldn't it? Favorite person in the whiskey. 
Um, I'm going to say Struan. Struan is like a cool guy to hang out with. Struan Grand Ralph, you, you, obviously you know who Struan is, but just in case anybody else good, doesn't know. That's a good choice. I like the way his Instagram page is now just all about the baby. Yeah. It, was the, it was the dog for a while and now it's just the baby. Brilliant. Yeah. One day I'll get back to Glenfiddich. <laughs> <laughs> Last one, favourite sporting activity? Watching football. Does that count? I, why not? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right, Brian. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's always a pleasure to chat to you, man. And I look forward to the next time we, we, we'll we catch up in person. I'm sure it's going to be soon. Um, but yeah, thank you again and great to see you. Yeah, no problem. No, I'm very happy to do it. Good to, good to speak to you.